So I'm going to be talking about the heat project that you've just heard, heard of. Um, so from the iOS developer point of view, and I've been working some time on heat as well, so um, we'll see how that is, uh, can be integrated. I'm going to do a short recapitulation about cloud formation and heat, about sort of why should we as iOS community care, um, how if we decide to integrate heat with iOS, which I think would be a good idea, we'll come to that. Um, how would we go about doing that? Um, then I'll go around, go about um, sort of what's happened so far. I'll show a sort of show proof of concept demo that uh, of, of the work that's already been done. And finally, I'm going to talk a bit about um, sort of what would have to be done in the future. And I'd like to invite you um, to some discussions and talk about issues that the whole integration process might be facing. Um, I hope you don't mind coming to the Cloud formation. Um, Steve mentioned that a bit at the beginning. It's it's sort of conceptually similar to what we do with deployments. I think actually our deployment concept was based off of that, right? Well, they sort of evolved at yeah. the same time, but yes, All right. exactly so, the same idea. So the basic idea is that you have some sort of declarative language where you describe a set of virtual images, such as instances, how they're in interconnected together, what services they're running, and possibly some other stuff. And you just take the whole blob, send it to an API, and it'll just launch it as you've just seen. Um, iOS, uh, sorry, CloudFormation does it over this sort of RPC API. Now, apart from Conductor, CloudFormation does a lot more um, than just launch instances. It does S3, it can attach EBS volumes and everything, uh, all that you can specify within the template. It has, uh, aside from EC2 images, uh, instances, it has um, some other resources like you can specify launch me and Oracle database with 5 gig storage or whatever. Uh, things like that, also scaling, we've seen that. And then the other thing that it supports that we don't have, and we've heard a lot today actually, is the networking capabilities. So now Heat is about nine months <coughs> old and it started as a sort of um, open stack clone for for those kind of features and its goal is to provide every feature that um, that cloud formation supports. It's not quite there yet, but we're getting close. And right now, apart from, except for the networking, most of the features are done. Um, it has its own REST API, which is similar to other APIs from the OpenStack community, and it's easier to work with and sort of easier to extend if need be. And it added some up, some additional features, such as high availability, which you haven't seen today, but the basic proof of concept is in there. And so, what? Um, yeah, and yeah, the, the future. So where this will evolve is there's <coughs> already been uh, talk about uh, multiple template formats. So template in heat and, and car formation way is what we call deployable. Right, so that's the that's the thing that you where you describe what's uh, what you want to launch. So they plan to support Tosca later on, and possibly some other open standard if there's something that evolves. Um, the the other goal is for feature parity with CloudFormation. So mainly that means the networking stuff. Um, additional CloudFormation specific, uh, non CloudFormation specific features. So such as high availability, possibly cluster um, storage and stuff like that. And the last two points are mostly the focus of what I'd like to talk about. One thing is that he right now is connected to OpenStack as the single backend, but it'd be great if we could use all of that logic and all those features with other providers as well, such as EC2 or mostly, I mean, Revan and stuff like that. Um, However, one important thing that he like would like to do was to become a full member of the OpenStack core suite of projects. Um, and any, that, that kind of makes uh, this sort of thing difficult, the multiple provider support, because 
it might potentially hinder the, the OpenStack uh, incubation process. Mm -hmm. So I need to confirm the start type of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so, so we need to you know, tread safely around that. So right now, sort of all the work that Ian and I have done, we sort of fought um, the projects and just wrote some concept and thought about how we would go about doing this in a proper way and just want to show something quickly and then decide what to do. OpenStack can't be all that too bothered about conflict of interest. Ian, we became a member, yeah? Yeah, <laughs> but... Um, so, I mean, really... <laughs> You'd be surprised, but yes, your point is well taken. Yeah. So, um, why should us as IELTS community care? I think you've heard a lot of stuff later on, but the, the good thing is that there's a lot of code we're now using that we could just get rid of. Uh, things like Taskomatic, Idealmatic, because that he could provide us with. There's a lot of um, deployment specific logic with regards to launching and stopping and stuff like that, that again, he, would, he already has to take care of. And lastly, this is sort of um, maybe controversial topic, I, I'd like to hear your input on that. But essentially, he provides a superset of Audrey's functionality. So possibly if we could replace, um, you know, if we could add up, add up T, Audrey would no longer be needed. As long as it works, I don't think anyone's going to Yeah. No. Yeah, but, well, you know, just, developers, but. Well, that's, you know. <laughs> They've moved on to bigger and better things. Yeah. yeah. The other thing is, um, if we were to adopt heat, we would, <laughs> we would immediately, uh, or almost for free, get, you know, features such as monitoring, load balancing, auto scaling, high availability, networking once it gets in, which is, again, you know, something that we've heard today the customers would like to have. Yeah. And anything else that he would provide later on, we could get reasonably cheap into conductor just by, you know, by virtue of using heat. So the, the, the sort of last point is, and this is something that we've hit upon again, uh, conductor is quite a big and unwieldy and sort of the, a lot of various parts are compacted together and it would make sense already for, the, you know, we're talking already about separating some parts outside of conductor, two separate projects that do one thing and do it well, such as Tim, the permission engine, and I would put Converge UI there as well, and maybe other stuff. Um, so he is already a project that is reasonably mature, though there's a lot of stuff that needs to go on uh, still, but it's pretty good, and is focusing on launching multi-instance deployments with you know complex setup. So we could you know we could we could just leverage that and again reduce the complexity of conducting. And lastly he I kind of that, that that's just my personal opinion that he already has a better better upstream that um, conductor I've no um, empirical data for that but sort of from my involvement with both upstreams that seems to be the case. And it has the sort of uh, upstream support behind OpenStack. There's lots of OpenStack people interested in me, and lots of people who are already using OpenStack and really just want to use the orchestration capabilities. So this would, again, uh, I'm not sure how much of that would then overlap with us, but it's again another component that we would be using that has its own strong upstream anyway. And you know, lastly, we've heard time and again today that, you know, at least some of the features that we don't support that are well, going to land in heat soon, just going to be great. So, the integrating effort. Um, there's been a couple of uh, missing pieces to, to sort of, that, that we needed to cover with Ian to merge those two together. The first thing is that he had no multiple provider, provider support. The second thing is um, that we're using a different different uh, de uh, templating language that he does, so that needed to be some sort of conversion tool. Um, then there's the thing that Conductor right now has has no support for, it, you know, swappable backend backends for launches or whatever. And lastly, uh, sort of, we need to. This isn't really a missing piece, but we need to figure out what to do with um, cloud formation features such as 
S3 networking and stuff like that, that aren't supported in every provider. Uh, because, um, I don't know, OpenStack and, say, Brennan probably are going to support most of what uh, AWS does, but the other providers might not. So we need to figure out sort of how to tie that whole thing with Conductor and you know what to do about that. That's pretty easy. 500 internal error. Well, that's that's <laughs> one that's one possibility. But we need to sort of make that happen. So for the past maybe a month or two, Ian and I. Um, oh, that's you. Oh, yeah. I was wondering who the chick was. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so, so we sort of tangled this unholy mess and try to try to make a simple proof of concept that would allow us to launch a multi-instance multi deployment in very much the same way that we do now, except it would go through heat. And once we'll have that. We could then, you know, show that to you guys essentially, get your feedback and uh, figure out sort of how to do it properly, what pieces we need to add that are missing and stuff like that, what complications might arise. So the first thing is that, that we needed to do was um, get him talking with Delta Cloud or some sort of multi-provider thing. We looked at other things, but in the end, Delta Cloud still came up as, as the sort of best idea we had. Um, Damn hipsters. Yeah. <laughs> so the problem is that he is written in written Python along with the rest of the OpenStack language, and we had no Python bindings for Delta Cloud, so we wrote some. Um, the other thing is that Heat Engine is was tied to OpenStack API so far, so we needed to sort of figure out a way how to swap that out and use Delta Cloud. And lastly, the CloudFormation API that he was using, um, you know, it wasn't really built with the concept of multiple backends and multiple, you know, API, uh, API endpoints and different credentials for those in mind. So we need to figure out the whole authentication stuff. So the Delta Cloud Python client is uh, on GitHub here. Some of it has been contributed back to back to um, Delta Cloud Core. Uh, not all of it, we plan to you know, get, get it up soon, soon, but again, the main point of the proof of concept was to get something working very quickly, so we'll, we sort of thought that we'd figure out the sort of upstream stuff and do it properly later on. Um, we wrote it almost from scratch. There was this small Python library that actually told Delta Card, but it hasn't been updated in a year and it did not work. So It was written by Ovidio. Oh, no, that's it. Like one yeah. and a half year ago. So. Yeah, so it was there's there were some good it's ideas, but stuff. it was not working. We needed to yeah. bring it up to date, add the features that we needed. Um, we were using the JSON content type. If you know a Delta Cloud supports both XML and JSON, um, which we thought might make it again quicker because that's that's easy to work with in Python. However, there's been several bugs. Some of them were fixed. Some are being fixed right now. But you know that. So should be fixed right there. now. I, if not, I have a patch for that at least right now. Ah, cool. Yeah, stuff. awesome. Yeah. So that's that. If you if you clone this or uh, go to go to Delta Cloud upstream, um, do you guys do find the stuff? Yeah. Do you guys do releases of this? So it's like version zero point whatever. Um, 0 .2, 0 .2. Right now we don't. This is this is essentially just you know. Free form. Yeah, yeah. We just you know wanted to do something. Essentially hack it together, make sure it's working, and then figure out how to do it properly. Um, the other thing is um, making once we have the Delta Cloud client, um, making it work with Heat. And the good thing about Heat code base that actually kind of surprised me well, was that there was essentially a single file and in it a single function that returned uh, a return an object that sort of had all those OpenStack API calls. So what we could then do is just swap that out with something that provides the same interface, talks to Delta Cloud, and we're done. So that's, that's him. Again, this is a fork of heat, which, which has that later on we want to right now it's just you know hard coded it returns the other thing but uh, later on we'd like that to be configurable. That, yeah. that file single approach is that common to many of the uh, OpenStack components? Is to be honest, I have no idea. That, 
I was just wondering if that was the whole modular thing that Stephen yeah. was talking about. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I kind of, um, you know, I would expect that uh, it would say instantiate the, the sort of API client in every file that, that uses it or something like that. Instead, it's, uh, oh, you know, I was afraid that that would be the case, but it was not. So, yeah. And that's uh, that's working as well. I've managed to then you know use normal heat tools and to la launch uh, multi instance deployment in EC2 via via this. Um, I'm in talk with some some guy from Revan who'd like me to try this out on Rev. I don't have a Rev setup, but that that's going to happen next week. So we'll see how it goes. And so. Next, what we had to do was sort of look at the CloudFormation API and how to how to integrate it with that because he mainly is an API that you talk to. So once we want to integrate conductor with heat, we're going to have to talk to the heat API. And the CloudFormation API, it works, but you know that's the possible blocking that Google is used, and it's kind of hard to extend to our needs when we want to add new features and stuff like that. So sort of in parallel to the work I've described previously, the Heat guys um, designed and implemented another API that's closer to OpenStack. And so we decided to, to use that instead. And you know we have a we have a good way to, to actually pass in um, the data cloud endpoint URL and credentials for, for any specific provider um, that we need to talk to just with <coughs> a single request. So so that's worked out pretty well. And you know, as I mentioned, the, the good benefit of this is that if we ever need to extend the, the API, say with, I don't know, some callbacks or more um, information metrics and stuff like that, we could just do that. Or at least we could do it easier than with the CloudFormation API. The deployable versus template format. So the good thing is that um, they're conceptually rather close. Um, again, I don't know if that was a coincidence or a conscious decision. One is XML, the other is JSON, but uh, sort of the, the conversion is quite straightforward. So right now in, in my fork of conductor, I just you know have the have the deployment that conductor passes when it launched when it want, wants to launch a deployment. And I just generate the JSON from that and then push them to heat. Um, right now that's in the conductor and it's fairly incomplete because again for the from the point of the proof of concept uh, all we needed to do was launch multi-instance deployment so the other features that need to go in later on but they're not there yet. What Hugh suggested I think was a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so the idea there for now at least is, was that in the, in the conductor database um, Essentially, we would store the XML as now, but it yeah. would be kind of an on-the-fly launch this and yeah. convert it. In. Would yeah. you convert it the other way as well, which might give us the ability to take um, you know, something like CloudFormation's document and import that into Conductor, uh, yeah. converting it to the XML? That that might that's uh, sort of on this. So yeah, right now it's a one-way conversion yeah. and very limited, but um, it would actually make a lot of sense if we had a sort of isolated library that could, you know, do two-way conversions between those two formats, which should not be a problem. Right. And, and I guess that library would be used by yeah, conductor for yeah, making those yeah, kind of yeah, conversions. Exactly. And we could then import the CFM templates, potentially. Yeah. And easily add Tosca or any other new format that comes up. So the conductor integration path, that's, that's sort of the last bit um, for the demo. Um, so yeah, I just create a new file that has the conversion stuff and, and the requests, um, yeah, which handles talking to, to the API essentially. And so what happens is when we launch a deployment, I hijack in the deployment code, um, I just hijack the send launch request uh, function and instead of sending a task to Taskomatic, um, I make a request to heat, which will then launch the, launch the deployment. And then whenever we render a page that shows deployables, uh, sorry, deployments, um, the naming thing there. Yeah, so whenever 
we render a page that shows uh, deployments. Um, we make another another request to heat right before we are render it and just inject the the heat data in there. Which is again, this is a hack. This is not how it should be, but it's sort of to, to show that it's working. <laughs> so is the plan there to actually keep heat state in sync with the database, or to not store deployments locally and then just call out to heat? You know, that's time? that's a good question. That's something that we need to figure out. Um, right now, I just ignored that. But yeah. uh, in the proof of concept, but I think ideally. Um, he should be able to store all the sort of instance and deployment related metadata, so we should just let it do that. And but we will, for permissions and stuff like that, we will probably need, um, you know, to have some yeah. notion of object in our database. Right. So 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 we, we can see kind of an object yeah. ID, but the rest of the metadata we yeah. have to leave in heat. Yeah, yeah, that's that's sort of my thinking at this sure. point. But yeah. All right, so. Now I'm gonna show you the proof of concept. Don't be your, yours works, eh? Sorry, <laughs> yours works. <laughs> I mean, it should be. Sorry. It's not gonna be anything um, special because uh, yeah. So first, I'm just gonna show that um, what was featured earlier. None of the open things are running, um, so. This is heat running without OpenStack. Um, this here is uh, the heat engine and heat API logs, which are sort of the two main components I'm, uh, I'm interested at this point. The, the other stuff, such as cardboard and metadata, um, those are those will come into play later on when we sort of extend the features, but they're not important right now. And the rest is just you know conductor, um, delta cloud, and Warehouse that the ones could scroll up. So I'm just gonna to demonstrate that it actually talks to here. I'm just gonna scroll this over. And yeah, here is conductor and the Delta Cloud API without JavaScript. But you know, so this is if it, yeah. So this shows that there are no instances right now. I'm gonna launch. Let me first show you the deployment I'm going to be launching now. So, <laughs> by the way, how long is the time? Is it like 15 minutes? 15 minutes. It's, it's configurable. Right. <laughs> At least. Yeah. So, I have one uh, deployable which has three instances. Let me show you the XML. Um, it, it uses a normal image that I imported from Delta Cloud. So, you know, essentially all the mini image management stuff just breaks um, sort of outside of this. So nothing, nothing we need to worry about. So as long as the image is provisioned properly for heat, it'll just work. Yeah, um, heat is able to launch bare images as well. It just it uses the the agent for stuff such as auto scaling and moni monitoring, okay. but. Sort of on the scale of launching bare images that you can then provision at runtime, or launching fully provisioned images, um, both iOS <coughs> and can can operate on both sides of that scale and yeah. anywhere in between. What? Yeah. So if the heat have an agent running in a, in the case, yeah. so it means that with the heat we don't need to use a data injection anymore. Um, we are starting an instances. I don't know. I think the. I think we'll have to do the same thing which Audrey does, which is mm -hmm. which I'm not sure how that works at the moment. You have to tell the instance where to find the heat server. Yeah, somehow. yeah. So, so it's exactly the same principle. Exactly. The yeah. Same. Okay. Yeah. I think because so. I was, I thought that if there is a there is a heat uh, agent running inside, we can just stream the user data directly to this heat yeah. agent and bypassing injection. No, the, then you don't have any way to boot. You don't have any way to bootstrap the heat agent because yeah. it doesn't know. It, it doesn't know where the server. Well, it can broadcast or something like that. No. It's, 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 it's well, well, I guess, Mikhail, if we know the IP address of the server, which does card knows, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we could just, you know, have the sort of the image that we launch have have the heat agent be already installed there yeah. and listening on some sort of port. But you know, there's going to be some security issues with that. Because yeah, if, if anyone can, you know, 
Okay. Yeah. But sidebar, we'll do. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. But yeah. You, you know, that's one of those things that we need to discuss eventually yeah. to figure out how to properly. So, I'm going to be launching that uh, that deployment. That to be dazzled. Yeah. So <laughs> let me just. Is that fun? <laughs> so this is this is heat uh, showing that you know we actually talked to it and this this is at the back of the request that that I sent and sorry, and here is the deployment running and that's essentially it that it it doesn't right now it reads from the heat ser heat service it reads the the deployment status, so the green thing that means that that's an information we received from HEAT. Okay. But most of the other things uh, are still not are still not there yet. Okay. Yeah, so this is a, just, uh, if you guys have any questions about just the demo or stuff about that. What's your plan for um, collecting collecting launch time parameters? Same ideas with Audrey, basically? Yeah, I think so. So, um, the, the way I'm going to then continue with some other stuff, but... Oh, I don't want to jump ahead on you. Yeah, right. Uh, so, so the, but I can sort of, this is, this is uh, the, the, the final part, which is things that I sort of realized that we need to have a discussion about at some point. I just want to iterate through that quickly. Um, so, the launch time parameters. Um, the way it works with heat is in the in the template you specify you know that this thing needs to be parameterized. Uh, Steve showed a bit of that later on. I can actually show you an instance of that. I think. But parameterized like in the template, yeah. Yeah. So, for instance, here the DB name thing, um, that is a specification of, of a parameter that's supposed to be filled up at launch, launch time, and it has some default value, some description they can then show in the UI, and you know, you can specify things like um, data type, um, some, um, you know, minimal length, maximal length, and you know, some sort of uh, limitations, and um, when it doesn't fall into that construction <coughs> that, that you should show back in, in the UI. So what the proof of concept did was it, it didn't use any parameters at all, it just had everything um, about. But he doesn't care how you gather the, the parameters, it's just that when you launch the, when you want to launch the stack, if you provide the parameters, it will just use them. If not, it will use the default values or it will fail if the parameter is required. So we could just use the same UI part as Audrey is using right now, generate the template in this yeah. format and, and... Just have to change the UI generator yeah, a little bit. Yeah, and or whatever. Whatever. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, that's it. Makes sense. So one thing that sort of we need to do is document what providers right now support what cloud formation features that are not uh, already in Delta Cloud. Um, some of that would be things like uh, networking and maybe, I know, I know that Delta Cloud has support for um, S3 like storage, right? Yeah. But then again, not every we also does We're working that. on the networking. Yeah, right yeah, now. right. So, so we sort of need to know what's that, what the users would like to do. And then figure out what to do. That you know, one thing is just just sort of decide that we're not going to support anything that all providers don't support. But like that would be kind of like things like load balancer yeah. that uh, Steve showed. Yeah. Like this is supported uh, in Delta Cloud for like three providers. Yeah, like yeah, cool. You can create load balancers. You can assign instances to load balancer. Works. Yeah, nobody used that. <laughs> and that, that's actually the, the load balancer thing. Uh, OpenStack doesn't have that. So what we've done with Heat is we've talked about that. We wrote a yeah, we wrote a load balancer that we sort of fall back on. But if if Delta Cloud supports that, we could just 
put some of these things, we could use them natively if they're there, and fall back to some internal implementation. You can talk all. about that whole service enumeration thing in general, because that's kind of a core problem, right? Yeah. So, so, so um, looking at that, Ian Meng, but that, that's sort of, um, so, so he's looking at that right now, and he's sort of working with the, the data cloud folks, and that's something that just we need to, you know, enumerate and talk about what to do there. Um, so yeah, the so the, the proof of concept I showed. Sorry, I was just very confused a bit. Uh, so what needs to happen now is add some missing features, such as some some parameters, some provisioning capabilities, so that we can show you know sort of more heat-like functionality. Because right now we just want some bad instances. Um, make the code a bit cleaner, a bit more robust, so so that it's actually usable and then, you know, gather some feedback. Um, the, some things that we need to talk about then later on, and this is essentially just a food of, food of thought, is so what to do with Audrey? I think we could, we could just drop it if he will work well, which I think it should support all the same features, so if it does work well, we could just drop Audrey unless there's reason not to. Um, I thought about it for a bit, and oh, from the user, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, interrupting yeah. you again, but I think yeah. we we can't drop Audrey because we saw that as a product already, right? <laughs> so that's, you know, that's as long as we the, provide a compatible yeah. replacement, we can drop it like a hot potato. Yeah. My my <laughs> sort of point here is, from my thinking of it, I think that we can just swap heat. As a backend and get Audrey, and you know the users will not be any wiser. We could still, you know, just convert the because what Audrey does is in the conductor interface yeah. it says config server yeah endpoint. So check it endpoint and it yeah passes the information. It just really yeah. works. Um, and you know conceptually those two are very similar anyway. Audrey uses an in, an agent within an instance, so does Heat. Um, both have some sort of metadata server for talking to, communicating with that agent. They both have some sort of way of entering the parameters at launch time. So yeah. I think that should be doable. If you're really, yeah. really, really sleazy, yeah. what you could do is where it says in the RPM, order agent, <laughs> you go replaced by or superseded yeah. by heat agent, yeah. voila. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. But you know. Um as far as image both thing goes, so that there's no modifications to image factory needed. We just you know, since we're talking to Delta Cloud, it's the same thing. Um, but there are two sort of tools that keep bundles that make um, some of the image building tasks easier and we could adopt those features. So the first one is heat choose. Um, GEOS is just an app operating system that's essentially the smallest OS space that you can launch and then SSH into and provision. Um, so this tool essentially takes an OS template, builds it, and adds optionally, uh, inserts the heat agent into that. So, so you can just you know, it, it's easier than doing that manually with us, and then it registers it with uh, with plans, which is the open sex image store. So this could be like a we could have that in the image factory, like like an option to you know just include during the building include mm -hmm. the agent, 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 which I don't know if that's going to be useful. I think it might if we adopt this. I think we have to do. Well, the only yeah. yeah. the way we do it in Audrey is we. We basically say, you know, in the packages we say include the right. order agent, so it's right. equivalent to the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right now the yeah. agent isn't packaged, so we can't do that. We might, but, wanna, yeah, we might not sense. want to have to rely on the user to get specified in the package. We might want image factory to put it in there anyway, to me, because if it's fundamental to. It's a, it's if it's replaced all of and it's we can't have a big loop time without this agent. Yeah. 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 It needs to go in there and all sorts. It, it's not. Oh, go ahead, sorry. We came to that already in the target content XML. So, if in a particular 
uh, Aeolus setup that we've got, um, in the target content XML, I think target content XML, you say like Fedora 16, if it's in an environment where all your Fedora 16 needs your audio agent, it's included there in every Fedora 16. If the user doesn't have to put it in the template at all, it just goes in. So you'd be effectively replacing the audio yeah. agent with the heat agent in exactly yeah. the same scenario. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So, so, so um, can, can I just quickly mention, Thomas, so you don't actually need to use the heat specific agent just to do post build customization. Um, no, we use Cloud in it to do that. And then the, the, the agent which talks to the, um, for instance metadata is only required if you want to update the instance configuration um, after the initial customization. Mm -hmm. So that could be another thing. Okay. But I don't think we'd want to have two different paths for image building for say if you want to, if you want this image to then be part of a uh, a deployment which can scale. Yeah. You might say, oh well that's unfortunate because you built it the wrong way. Two months ago, yeah. yeah. But you can always install it later on, I think, you know. Then but yeah, you but then you're ticking around with your image, don't you? It'd be much better if we just put this agent <coughs> in the image because it then enables, you know, all the cool functionality. You know, I would, I would, I would agree with you, but um, there's, so from talking to the people who are um, using heat or looking into using heat, uh, not all of them want to leverage the heat agent, so they don't want to have it in there. And you know, it's it's another thing that sort of is running there, and because it's able to talk over the network, it might potentially be a security issue. Uh, so you know, I can understand providing people the option of not using that. Yeah. But well, let's but, not let's yeah. not yeah. grapple. Yeah. 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 You could also make it a site. I mean, you, I can imagine possibly even sort of how you agree to fix. You know, never use it, always use it, or you know, provide an option yeah. that way. Yeah, and, and an administrator could prevent it from being used entirely, or could make sure it's always there so that the users yeah. don't forget to include it and then wonder why their systems aren't scaling. The, the people who don't want the heat agent in the instances do actually use cloud in it anyway. Right? Yeah, but that's just once. I think so, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah, exactly. So, so, so you've always got the option if you want to use the cloud in it, but that still needs a source of metadata. So that just basically gets the, um, the no user data. Um, uh, and then it can't then get updates from the heat database service. Mm -hmm. Essentially, if all you care about is provision the thing at at the first boot, yeah, um, then then you don't need the agent. If you want to do the other stuff, yeah. such as yeah. obviously yeah. high yeah. Okay. Um, the the heat pre-built tool. What that does is you feed it the heat template, which is so. You feed it the deployment description, and it will pre-build and pre-provision the instances. So you know the the part that takes longest on launch, on launch the, the, all the yum install stuff that we saw in Steve demo. Um, you could do that once, have you know a separate in, separate image for, for every instance that you describe in the heat deployable, and have the launch then quicker. Because you don't have to install, uh, you install every package when you launch the thing. So I don't understand that for the workflow later. So yeah, right. Okay. Um, that, that that might be. I'm not sure. That might be something that we're able to do. Or, no. But what you could do is uh, when you build an image, you can specify all of that in the TTL, right? And then also install everything during the image building. What we're doing essentially is just making it a bit simpler. So you feed it the deployment, and it'll build you deployment-specific images that then start up quicker. Um, the other thing, which is going to be some sort of um, problem, I think, is heat is in Python, iOS is in Ruby, and that's not going to change. And you know, one one thing that where this is probably going to um, slow us down a bit is that we can't, you know, call Python code directly from Ruby and the other way around, unless I'm missing something. So you're going to have to be using some sort of API, either uh, RPC, which is what, you know, the OpenStack projects use in, um, in uh, sort of inside um, internally, and some sort of API from the rest to, to talk to the other side. We're doing that already with Image Factory and stuff like that. But for instance, with the deployment to um, heat template conversion tool, it'd be great if heat could use that and then support you know multiple templates 
and if conductor can use that and support multiple, um, you know, export multiple templates or import, but then, you know, if we write it in Ruby, it's probably not going to be easy to, to use it from within Python and the other way around. So there's always going to be this sort of friction there. But I don't think it's necessarily that big a deal. It's just something to keep in mind. Um, he, well, Steve talked a bit about Heat's permission model, which is essentially open sex permission model. And it's probably not something that is enough for, for iOS. Um, so what we probably going to have, we need to figure that out. What we're probably going to have to end up doing is uh, just store the metadata in heap that that are deployment specific, and have a sort of just a shim object that references that heap. Um, yeah. Just leaving you the different that we're doing now. I mean, right yeah. now, you know, we already kind of handle permissions on the front end and then send the request to Delta Cloud. Yeah. So we've yeah. been doing that here as well. Yeah. And basically. Again, because we store the objects uh, kind of references to them on our site, a user goes to a page to view a deployment. Yep. Um, we check the permissions based on our database, and if we verify the user, yes, you can see this, then we go to heat and get it. Yep. So yep. that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, one, uh, one problem that I've encountered as a sort of reservation from some of the people is that bringing in heat means bringing in more services that can crash. Um, and I'm not sure what we can do about that other than, you know, make sure that that doesn't happen or that we can recover from that. Um, we be losing two omatics and gaining one? Uh, well, <laughs> two omatics. <laughs> Heat is not a single it's service. Ah, it's um, at the bare minimum. It's the API service and the engine service, which does the actual stuff. Stack launching. It's replacing the library too, so there's a couple of it. The other thing is, though, if you want the auto scaling and um, launch time parameters, that's another two separate services, right? <coughs> well, yeah, at the moment, um, all of the metrics we use for auto scaling decisions are reflected by our cloud launch API. Yeah. However, um, if you've got some other um, metric source which, can, which, which we can plug in, yeah. the, I mentioned the monitoring stuff being in flux in open yeah. open stack. In due course, ideally, we want to have hypervisor level metrics, and we don't want to be collecting everything from the instance. Okay, cool. So, so that, you, in due course, you can probably be doing auto scaling along those two processes. Right. right. The, the other thing is that Delta Cloud right now, you can run it as a library without you know, running any sort of daemon. And so we're not using that now, but the argument is we could if we still you know, use Delta Cloud directly. But since that's a Ruby specific thing, thing that he, I don't think, can leverage. He has to talk to the Delta Cloud service. What, what, what if we rack mounted Delta Cloud on the same server as Elis, just ran it with a different port? Hmm. Yeah, I think we could do that. Yeah. Could it mount it? I, As rack like, service, uh, rack middleware, right? Yeah, I have a demo for that, so I can show you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he should look at Someone's thinking it's so it's just yeah. hitting a service on the yeah. port, right? Yeah. All right. Win one for the manager. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the other, I think that's the last thing. No, almost. Um, the other thing is, I, I'm not gonna make any uh, assumptions about the performance, but because we need to measure that, and right now it's too early to do that. Um, but what we're doing now is, whenever we render a page that shows a deployment or an instance, we hit heat and you know, get the data back, that could potentially be slower, but it's sort of architecturally it's cleaner right now, and we can then okay. deal about caching and stuff like that later on. But you know, that it's possible that there's going to be some performance concerns. Um, plus, you know, Conductor has been tested from a performance point of view. He has not been, so again, if we solve that in, some of the issues that we might have already solved might need to be addressed again. Um, yeah. And so I think the last thing that uh, needs to happen before we actually go ahead and integrate this is to, to figure out a proper way to do this in a sense that all of the communities um, agree with, that is, he does a card and I always, because that's going to be uh, code changes on all sides. And 
we we need to figure out things like which data is going to going to go there. I think with the with the deployments, it's very clear clear, but there might be some other instances that we need to figure out <coughs> what's what. And lastly, we sort of need to decide on whether whether we're going to just adopt heat wholesale or whether we're going to decide that it's an optional part that you can use and configure. I personally would argue against that just because it would complicate the code a bit more. But what we could maybe do is what you know you guys with Tim are doing, which is you have a separate service image factory and then have uh, the engine which could potentially swap backends. Um, maybe that's the way to do it. I don't know at the moment, but um, that's something that needs to be addressed. Yeah, I think if you make them heat optional, then you don't achieve the goal of getting rid of the yeah. automatic and yeah. such. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. We're, we're, we're going to end up just maintaining this stuff. duplicating yeah. the code. Yeah. Um, so that's it. Um, any questions? Yeah. What sure. about using Identify for connecting uh, from heat to the local point of function interface? Is possible? Um, is that I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do to, to be honest, I haven't used that personally, so I don't know. Maybe. Because that, that has uh, the interface for all the release? Yeah. So, shouldn't be that much problem? Possibly, possibly. Though, um, I wouldn't, yeah. I guess we could, we could look into that, but um, I don't know how, how well that would work, yeah. We ran both things in JRuby and Jython. <laughs> no wait, forget I said that. Controlling <laughs> part right there. Uh, Sorry, that was for a lecture. Yeah, we could yeah. use a talk box and deploy everything inside that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Talk box. Yeah. Then we would have two problems. <laughs> um, yeah, great idea. Is, it, is it possible to write uh, G objects in, uh, uh, in Ruby? Or I, I, and then introspect no, one to the other. I have no I, idea if they're I, I'm, I'm pretty yeah. sure you can I'm do that with the Python. I'm not sure if you can do that with the code, but still the... It would be as slow as a long dream, so... Seems like such a stupid issue. Well, it's really a non-issue anyway, because uh, honestly, with... Yeah. In my in my opinion, anyway, the edges of these components are really well defined, and it's a good spot for an API. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, <laughs> in, in, in fact, I think it's in some ways it's a benefit um, because it forces us to separate these things. Well, that goes back to the discussions that are going. You know, which of these things should be separate components with their own state, and which of them these should yeah. be. And so this this is. It. Separate component that should be run as a separate service, then the API communication is what you want. If it's yeah. something that makes more sense as a library or an engine or something, uh, then that's different. Then you want to make calls directly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I mean, Delta, Delta Cloud is a library right now. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, Delta's to be shared. So you can't do both.